From the birth of the Holden in 1948, more of us began to experience the country on four wheels. The windscreen framed the world like our very own movie theatre, and the view was changing. A recognisable Australia was coming into view, from the towns and cities to the Gibson Desert. We've been totally hooked by the car. The 1950s and 60s was an era when cars transformed the way we lived our lives. It was when our motoring heroes would conquer the world and we would finally become sexy. It was the time of the dream machines. The 1950s in Australia was a time to fulfil your dreams. We longed for peace and prosperity after the turmoil of war. For all those people who had put their lives on hold, affordable new suburbs appeared on the edge of town. New machines arrived to meet the dreams of a modern era, but none of them had the life-transforming power of the motor car. We lived in the outer suburbs of, of Melbourne. I can remember the cars kind of surreptitiously entering the suburb where I lived. There were no cars and then suddenly there were some cars. Suddenly there were, were more cars. Uh, suddenly there were bigger cars. Suddenly people were very proud of their cars. I think I was conceived in a car. Well, the idea of me anyway, because my mum and dad caught it. They, were, they would cuddle and kiss in his car outside the YWCA in Wagga Wagga where my mother lived and my dad would drive up from Melbourne. They were the car generation, and they would grow up experiencing the world from the back of a family car. You thought of the family not so much sitting around the kitchen table, or sitting in the car, you know, mum and dad in the front and the kids in the back. That was how we, we, we lived as families and how we discovered the country. By the mid-50s, one in three of us had a car. The FJ Holden was our number one choice. And they were so cheap, even drummers could afford them. I was playing with Dig Richards, and after two weeks of being a rock star, I could actually afford to buy an FJ panel van. It was practical because I played the drums, but it came in handy at the drive-in. <laughs> Everybody they were the car generation. One day, this generation of kids would change Australia more than any other. But for the moment, the baby boomers were on four wheels, discovering, taking it all in. We'd go on this trek, and my father used to sing old ballads to my mother and uh, talk about the Carlton Football Club, and, uh, you know, it was just a, a, an amazingly kind of beautiful uh, experience, this, this trip, even though it took, sort of, uh, as I say, about half a day to get wherever we were going in Victoria. These are the stories of everyday people who changed our history in their cars. 
my mother and father in the front, my father driving, three of us kids, I was the oldest at about six or seven in the back, and then my baby sister who was brand new. The old Volkswagen Beetle used to have a little sort of compartment over the engine now that I think of it. And she travelled to the Gold Coast in this lethal position, one would think, if anyone had run up the back of us. My first motoring memories of the family, and the one that really sticks in my mind, is the fact that they smoked a lot. And in winter, they would smoke with the heater going in the car, and the car would fill with smoke, and it would get that yellow nicotine film on the windows. I remember that distinctly. And you could just sort of and see God. Far away from the suburbs, a modern day pioneer was subdividing our wide open spaces. Not content riding Highway 1 with the rest of us, Len Bedell started building his own. He probably made more roads than anyone on the planet, all in our big backyard. We made about eight kilometres of road a day. We stayed out here for eight years. And all in all, we made over 6,000 kilometres of road right across to the Indian Ocean. Len worked for a top secret government project around Woomera rocket base. But his team was so good at making roads, they just kept going to the back of beyond. I got my little party of six together. Uh, bulldozer driver, grader driver, cook, and me, long distance supply driver, and I call them the gun barrel road construction party. They built the gun barrel highway, then the Anne Bidell highway, named after Len's wife the Gary Highway, named after their son, and the Connie Sue Highway, named after their daughter. One day, Len's ration truck caught fire and his team were forced to leave it behind. As a young boy, Bobby West saw it burn. It was the first vehicle he had ever seen. You have not see truck before? Or? No, last Nothing. time. First time. It was first time. Yeah. yeah we're going to have a look. Yeah. I'll show you. This one now, that Muruga? Yeah, this one now. Oh, Old yeah. truck, Russian truck. Russian truck. You why? This one was burned down. This truck here was burned down. And uh, we got flour, sugar on the side, and water there in that big container. Yeah. Enough food was left to feed his family for six months, and that became history. The truck now has pride of place at Kiwikara in the Gibson Desert. In the service of the atomic age, Len and his family had subdivided the desert. And the quiet country towns weren't ready for the hordes of suburban hoons that were about to arrive. <laughs> In 1953, Australia turned out at the roadside to watch a car rally go by. The Red X rally went right round the country. We'd made a competition out of discovering the continent. People could not only see this as a car trial, but they could see this as going out and seeing what's past Musselbrook, what's out there. Most of them had never been. It was the first time that filming actually took place in some of these remote outback towns and roads. And people back in the city were actually able to see this. Red X drew a cast of cool new characters into the nation's spotlight. Like a guy who hurled explosives at outback dummies called Jellignite Jack Murray. What he used to do, we'd find a paddock similar to the ones we have here, and he'd either find 
an old dunny or he'd just plant it there and uh, he, he'd just let it off. But he wouldn't be there when it went off. He'd, he'd walk away and uh, he'd be over here somewhere and off it'd go. Playfully letting off Jellignite has been Murray's hobby throughout the trial, a habit police have failed to applaud. He did let a couple of sticks off in some of the Western Australian towns and the police gave him a bit of talking to uh, and said, you know, and I know some Aboriginal people suddenly took off and couldn't understand what this huge explosion was. But Jack could talk his way out of anything. Start talking, Murray. Another character who signed up for the trials surprised everyone. Granny Conway. She drove her own Austin A40 through the 1953 trial, the very first one. 63-year-old Granny Conway is one of seven women to enter. She went down to Lark Hoskins, the dealers, for Austin and said, will you sponsor me? And they laughed at her and threw her out the office. And by the time that the trial got to Mount Isa, Granny Conway had become a national heroine. She was just such an irrepressible character, such a sense of fun. She kept on saying things like, the men who keep lifting the bonnets of their cars are just causing trouble for themselves. I say, leave it to the manufacturer. They know what they're doing. We should just drive the cars. Yeah, she didn't like that. She thought once you lift the bonnet, started to fiddle, there was going to be trouble. As long as you didn't lift the bonnet and didn't fiddle and there were no noises, everything had just run along nicely. Yeah, she was like that. There were two kinds of drivers in the Red X, the ones who were in it to win and the ones who wanted to explore Australia. Ron Torinac wanted to win. He took part with his friend, a backyard mechanic called Jack Brabham. It was the start of a partnership that would shake the world of motoring. Jack drove the difficult bits and I drove the, the, the simple roads. I navigated the difficult bits and I had to navigate and drive on the other roads. Jack went to sleep, so I didn't get much sleep for the whole round. The other thing we did in the car, to avoid stopping, we had a hole in the floor and a, and a little <laughs> funnel so we could pee through that and then put a cork in it afterwards. <laughs> but it wasn't enough to beat Granny Conway. Jack and Ron's car died in the ditch, but Granny Conway kept going. Not even Woomera rockets could stop her. She had a shot fired over the top of her car at the Woomera rocket range in 53. She'd come down a, a, a wrong road uh, to one of the sentry huts and the sentry fellow thought she was going to keep going, so he just fired a shot to stop her. She was a sponsor's delight in the end. By the time she got back to Sydney, Lark Hoskins changed their tune altogether. They put full-page advertisements in the newspaper saying the wonderful Granny Conway has come back. They presented her with a brand-new convertible Austin A40 and put her battered old car in their showroom windows. Red X had shown the suburbs were full of mavericks who wanted to prove themselves on four wheels. Jack Brabham would prove it to the entire world. A child of the Depression, he had big dreams. And yet Jack Brabham was as down to earth as a billy cart. We had to run the billy cart down Patrick Street and uh, <laughs> things like that, uh, which was quite dangerous, really. Jack had served during the war in the Air Force, seeing intense danger and high speed up close, and it thrilled him. After the war, he forged a path of speed and machines, founding a motorbike gang. And then a US Army buddy introduced him to midget car racing, the most dangerous racing there was. Jack designed and built his own midget while he watched fatal crashes all around him on the dirt track. He graduated to racing cars and got a sponsorship with Red X. But it took a clash with petty Australian officialdom to set the course of his life. 
suddenly I had a couple of people talking who said they were um, running motorsport in Australia, which I didn't know about. They said, well, you cannot have advertising on the side of your car. Now, this was news to me, particularly after I'd been using it for 12 months. I had fastest time in practice. And uh, I went to push the car out to the grid for the race, and they stood in front of me and said, you can't go out. I couldn't believe it. That, that really hurt, and I've never forgotten it either. If Australia couldn't give him the opportunities he craved, maybe Europe could. Jack Brabham took his talent to the world stage before a generation of famous expats like Barry Humphreys and Jermaine Greer. He landed in Europe in 1955 with the golden age of motor racing just beginning. The Formula One Grand Prix circuit was the pinnacle of car design and racing. When Jack arrived, Fangio was world champion. So far, Fangio is fastest of all. It was a world of glamour and danger. Cars round this corner all nose to tail. But tremendous excitement. Ascari has overshot the chicane. The car has somersaulted straight into the harbour. Frogman standing by dive in to rescue Ascari. Jack got unpaid work in the garage of the British Cooper Car Company. He became mates with the team boss, John Cooper, who shared his laconic humour. He soon graduated to the driver's seat. Luckily, I got on very well with John. He let me build a car in his workshop. And I actually built the first rear engine Cooper Formula One car. Cooper, Jack was hard pressed by Moss 18 at one stage and their cornering was a treat to watch. It took him four years to win a race. Bradham, however, roared away to victory in the second heat, and he went on to win the Grand Prix itself. But once he had won, he soon had many. In 1959, he won the Monaco Grand Prix, the British Grand Prix, and placed in the Dutch, the Italian, and the French Grand Prix. The World Championship came down to the last race of the year, the US Grand Prix, and Jack ran out of petrol. What did it feel like at that very moment? Well, it felt terrible, but I knew... Actually, what happened, John Cooper was refueling the class with a churn, and he put one churn less in my car by mistake, and um, my car ran out of petrol, but I won the championship. By pushing it over the line, it just gave me enough points to win the championship, so uh, it wasn't all lost. <laughs> and uh, I'm very, very pleased to have won it indeed, and I certainly owe a lot to John Cooper and the Cooper Car Company, and also my mechanics and everybody that's helped me get as far as I have, and it's been a great thing to me. <laughs> to prove it was no fluke, he won the World Championship again in 1960, winning five Grand Prix races in a row. Oh, he put Australia on the map as far as motor racing went. Absolutely. We'd never had a world champion. For an Australian, that, that was just phenomenal, you know. Wow, one of ours has won the world championship. Then he called up his old Red X buddy, Ron Toronak. Come on over, he said. We could build a car to beat these guys. He set Ron up in a shed just up the road from Cooper and matched his Australian salary. And together they started to build an Australian car that would beat the Ferrari. Jack offered me £30 a week to go and work for him doing these uh, uh, modifications for road cars and then I carried on that in the Formula One. One of the reasons I went to England, thinking back on it, is that I'd been, uh, I'd had about nine demerit points for speeding and I'd got caught out here, so I thought, well, I'll get out of that and start with a new licence in England. While Ron and Jack were putting Australia on the motor racing map, 
Back at home, the face of Australia was changing. In the ever-growing suburbs, a new workforce arrived to add to the flavour. Many of the new arrivals went to work on assembly lines, building the nation's new cars. In the early 50s, Holden had people down on the wharfs uh, with a little desk, and they'd basically sign them up as they came off the boat. They were either new Australians or POMs. People would come off the boat, they'd go into the Nissan hut and they'd go to work for Holden. Didn't matter where they came from. The plants were very interesting. Uh, you used to have a plant with the Turkish community and you had a plant with the Greek community. Just as at the time I was leaving, uh, we were starting to get plants with Vietnamese. And uh, interestingly, the Vietnamese were working in the foundry. And uh, because the, the Greeks wouldn't work in the foundry, but when they arrived here in the 50s, of course, the Greeks, that's where they worked, in the foundry. So there was a kind of pecking order for new immigrants. Holden would have been lost for, uh, if it hadn't have been for the immigration through that 50s and 60s period. For many migrants, like Vince Sorrenti's dad, a new car was proof they had made it in the lucky country. I remember seeing photos of him as a young man in the late 50s and early 60s. I mean, he'd been in Australia probably a decade by then, with his hair slicked back and the sort of, like, you know, 50s trousers and shirt, sleeves rolled up, and a cigarette in hand, with his leg up on the bumper bar of his black holder, and he just looked like the proudest man in the world. He was his machine in the new world in Australia. It was a wonderful shot, very romantic shot. It really defined you, your car. I could look at a car from that era and tell you whether that car was driven by a working class Aussie or a surfer or a Greek fruit shop owner. You know, they were, cars said a lot about you. Women took to the driver's seat in big numbers in the mid 60s. Families went from one car to two. Often it was a new car for Dad and an old bomb for Mum. My mother would have been driving around in an Austin A40, which was the most popular locally made car in Australia in the 1940s. And my mother would pick us up from school and the kids would come running out the street saying, can we push your car today, Mrs Black? Because it would never work. I do think at around that period, particularly mothers with children, it was a new thing for them to actually have their own car. New shopping centres appeared, like Chadston in Melbourne and Roselands in Sydney. The parking bays were on 45 degrees to make it easier for new women drivers to park. So it was a really freeing experience for women around that time. They didn't regard it, I think, as men did, as a kind of extension of their ego, that's not the impression I got. It was a practical thing, it was, it's liberated them, it made their life easier. So I think that for women of that era, it was part of the whole opening up of the world and their ability to do things spontaneously and to have an easier time and entertain and go out and have fun. It wasn't just mum who was getting a taste. By the 60s, the baby boomers were ready to get behind the wheel with a car of their own. Jack Nasser would one day be head of Ford globally, but his first car was an FX Holden. I was always mesmerised by the, the centre horn. It was beautifully done. It was iridescent red with this gold lion and what looked like a silver band around the rim of the horn hub. So that was my first uh, first vehicle. I think I paid $75 for it. 
<laughs> and it was worth every cent. <laughs> future chairman or boy from the bush, your first car was often the same. My first car I had uh, when I was a teenager is a FJ Alden, and that was the best car. So I like that car is about because it got my initial on it, FJ, like Brandy Chuburula. That's, that's why I like that Alden, and I was really happy but that FJ was really good. My first car was a Hillman Minx, which I still love to this day. It was 20 years old when I got it, and I thought, how am I going to keep this on the road? You know, it's, it's not going to be easy. So almost instantly, I got a job in the local service station, you know, pumping petrol on a Saturday morning, and I kind of learned to service the car. So it was quite an experience. I mean, I'd had to go into the workshop and learn about grease nipples, which I thought, oh, here we go, you know, but, and the calendar on the wall with the naked chicks, but you get, you know, you get, that's what you do, and I learned to look after that car and, you know, absolutely loved it. Steve Bisley learned to drive on the farm at age eight, but getting his licence ten years later was another story. The big cop from Warren gets in the passenger seat and off we go. And then I show him a couple of moves. Double shuffle, you know. And a couple of things I thought that impress him. Uh, he said, right, back to the station. We'd only been away about five minutes. So I thought, he's impressed, I've got the licence. And we pull up at the station, my father's waiting on the footpath. The cop gets out, he looks at my father and he said, take him away. He drives this thing like a loaded weapon. In the 1950s, the dream machine had been about family. But the kids of the 60s had different dreams. They took the safe family cars, hotted them up, dropped them down, turned them loose. Well, it didn't look much different to any other FJ. Mine lost its front bumper bar fairly quickly, but most of the modifications are underneath. Uh, things like twin carbies, a header or exhaust system, lowered with uh, lumps of iron in the rear springs and chop a couple of coils off the front springs. Uh, you didn't worry about brakes or shock absorbers, just as, so long as it went a bit faster and made a bit of noise. It didn't matter what the modification was, the, the thing was just working on them. We bored it out, it had a big cam in it, a big lumpy cam, so when you pulled up at the lights, it would bounce around the road a lot. You know, and it was always drag racing off the lights, it was big. Mixing speed and youth was a volatile cocktail. One Melbourne cop saw the danger and did something about it. Sergeant Sharples, he saw people thumping around Melbourne streets in hotties and thought he needs to have an avenue for them to let off steam and he organised for them to use the old airstrip at Fisherman's Bend. And once a month, we'd all go down there. From hot rod clubs, it spread to the main street of every town and suburb and became known as a lap of the main, an Australian mating ritual. In Ballarat, it happened on Bridge Street. There was the lap around Bridge Street where you would see the uh, the souped-up Holdens and Fords touring around and uh, you know, slowing up. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, I think we used to call perving at girls and all the rest of it. You know, that was, that was all part of it, and yeah, there was a circuit around there, and I guess that's a, a microcosm of what happened in most towns and most communities around Australia. In Wyong, it was a stretch of the Pacific Highway. You'd try and get them prepped for Saturday night, and you'd try and impress everybody, girls and, and guys, you know, and then there was and later then you'd fill up the car with whoever you'd collected on the night and, and go racing people. In Newcastle it was Hunter Street. And the fellas lead out the windows of their hot FJ Holdens with the chrome plated grease nipples and the double reverse overhead twin cam foxtails. They lean out and they say real cool things to the sheilas on the footpath like, uh, G'day. Where you going? How about it? <laughs> 
we'd all get into a car on a Friday or a Saturday night and just drive around Sydney. We didn't go anywhere, we just drove. The whole night out was a drive. You would drive for four hours. Y your car was a chick magnet too. I mean, it, uh, you could pull a girl with your car. It was, it was such a, a huge part of who you were. In Sorrento, Jean Kitson's dad was the local mechanic. She could outdrive the boys and do her own repairs. Boys had cars and girls had boyfriends. But I didn't have a boyfriend, I had a car. So I had freedom, I had security, I had um, uh, in absolute independence. I had respect, because I could talk about cars and drive and fix my own car. And some boys like to be driven by girls. Sort of rather luckily began a relationship with my first girlfriend, Elizabeth Drake, and she was a bit posh. She was from Hawthorne, I was from the outer suburbs from Reservoir. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth um, used to drive her mother's uh, Mini Minor, and this was very, very smart. And I used to feel so smart in this car. I was this working class kid hanging around with this posh girl from Hawthorne in this groovy, you know, two toned uh, uh, Mini Minor. You know, we used to think that we were like sort of people from some sort of new wave, modish uh, British movie, and we were so groovy. While a new generation of Aussie kids were hooning around, over in England, Jack Brabham and Ron Toronak were about to blow the racing world wide open. For six years, they worked to get their secret car right. When they wheeled it out of the shed, it shocked people with its sleek design. <laughs> The trickiest part was building an engine that would take the car to 200 miles per hour. I had an idea in my mind how I could build an engine uh, for it, but uh, to do that in England wasn't easy. Uh, I didn't have the contacts or the right people really behind me to do it. So he turned to an Australian small car parts company called Repco. Together they designed and built a three-litre engine and they dropped it into the car Ron had been building. Their first year of competition with the Repco Brabham, 1966, would be a milestone year for Jack. But the leaders are on to the banking for the first time, with Marlini's Ferrari in front of Scott Osmiorium and Alan Demura. Then Brabham, Gurney and Scarpiotti. turned 40 that year, and there were calls from the press that he was getting too old for it. You don't think then there's a ceiling for a racing driver? Do you plan to stay in Grand Prix racing long enough to equal or better Juan Fangio? Now, about retirement, Jack, have you any plans at this stage or not? Well, you can't retire on a winning spree, can you? <laughs> at the start of the Dutch Grand Prix, he came up with a prank to get his own back. walking stick and, uh, and a beard that he'd stuck on and he walked out to the track in the car with this and it sort of brought the house down a bit. <laughs> Luckily I won the race. If I hadn't won the race, uh, they'd have really crucified me. <laughs> The car set new design standards. By mid-1966, everyone wanted one of their Repco Brabhams. 
Ron was so busy making cars, he didn't notice that the biggest thing in his life had just happened. I didn't realise we'd won the championship. I was always interested in doing development on the car for the next race. And I flew back to Fair Oaks with Jack in the plane, and there were a lot of people standing around on the airfield. And I said, what are they for, Jack? And he said, oh, they want to interview us because uh, we've just won the World Championship. And that was the first time I realised we'd won it, because <laughs> we were just worried about the next race. Out in front, Jack Brabham proves he's not too old at 40 by this superbly confident win. The backyard mechanics had conquered the world. To win the world championship with an Australian-made engine was really something, and uh, it certainly hasn't happened again since. And uh, it was a great feather in our cap, I think, because we had a terrific Australian content, an Australian crew, a lot of Australian mechanics, and Ron uh, as our chief designer, so it was really a good Australian effort. In return, Australia put Jack and his achievements on a pedestal. My generation saw Jack as an Australian who could be extremely successful on a global scale and do it with elegance and humour and modesty uh, and still be the best there was in the world and not forget his Australian roots. By the mid-60s, Australia was booming. New products were changing the way we looked. It was a time of cool, clean lines. He left no time to New plastics, polyester, beehives, and the influence of the space age. A lot of the car companies that designed their cars because they wanted them to look like spaceships and to look modern and, and you know, and look a bit sexy. Television was reframing our view of the world and the power of advertising was really playing with our minds. Whether your family is small or large like this one, you'll enjoy the smoothest, most comfortable motoring What's always worked is when uh, a car advertiser knows exactly what the emotional reason is that somebody buys their car. And there is no getting away from a car says something about you. Holden was in trouble. It had been our number one car since the 40s, but it was looking drab compared to the sexy new Valiant and Ford models now being made here. Holden began to lose market share. The battle really begins in 1963 with the launch of the XL Falcon. The XL was a beautiful car compared to the Holden. Up until that time, Holden didn't introduce any features, whether they be safety or technological, because they didn't have to. They didn't have to ch change the car because or the mechanicals because they were still selling them and selling them. Many people stayed loyal to the Holden. Do you like the Holden Tiger? Really? <laughs> Certainly it's is. About the best car on the road. But Ford began to sell well. Suddenly, the act of buying a car admitted you to a tribe. Are you a Holden family? Or a Ford family? It was the start of a huge rivalry, which played out on the company drawing boards and in boardrooms well beyond Australia. By the time we got to the EJ, the Americans thought that the styling of the Holden car was drifting a little bit, so the EH, they took it back in-house. In Detroit, the world capital of the car, the GM bosses weren't happy with the new Holden, and the battle of the fenders began. And the big boss comes out and he said, now look, we got an overseas car that's coming in for you to do some work on. And this car's coming from Australia. And it turns out it was the HD holder. The characteristic of the front end of the HD was those, we called them cheese cutters, those pointy fenders. We were just about finished with the HD clay model. And uh, Bill Mitchell comes in one day and he says, oh, it's too, 
It ain't long enough, you know? He, he wanted 20 foot long cars, you know? So <laughs> Bill says, uh, make it longer. Push those, push those fenders out. Now, it also transpired that we had one of the engineers, the body engineer from Holden back there, kind of watching over us. So Reggie was there to make sure that everything came out just the way that it had to. And he says, oh, look, I can't make that. Cut them back, you know, take two, three inches off of them. Anyway, we did that. Next day, Mitchell comes in, what, 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 what's happened here? You know, and they all upset, God. And if you had a time-lapse camera there, you'd have seen the buddy front end going in and out like this. And I never saw an HD until I came down here, you know, several years later. And damn it, it was just like the clay model, <laughs> exactly. America won the battle of the cheese cutters, but the challenges kept coming. Experts could see the future arriving from Japan. I pass. I went to the 63 Sydney Motor Show and saw a fully imported Toyota Crown. Four cylinder, good looking car, with everything known to man. Electric aerial, heater, demister, you name it. Beautiful Japanese upholstery, tinted glass, beautiful, beautiful finish, and a lot of chrome. Glenn Patterson's mum used to have a Ford Capri, um, and she would pick him up from school in that. Then one day, it wasn't the Ford Capri, it was an, a Mitsubishi Galant. Uh, and I thought, gee, that's uh, it's a bit odd. Maybe she's had a stroke or something. I don't know what's gone on there, because it was very strange. And then Japanese cars just seemed to bob up. You'd go to the parking lot and there'd be Japanese cars. And I said, I think this, this mob will lead the world in car production in 10 years. The competition was fierce and there was no time to lose. Holden needed a winner like never before and they needed to find a new market of cool young consumers miles from the safe mum and dad market. This is where it's happening, right here in your world. Holden's marketing team went into overdrive. Things aren't like they used to be. Times have changed. People aren't afraid to express themselves anymore. Today's people are dynamic. They live at a faster pace. Individuality is a living thing. Today's world belongs to today's people. It's a winner's world. In a locked room in Melbourne, a crack team of metal artists were bending Australian suburban aesthetics and sexuality. They came up with a beautiful two-door body and a monster motor. All they needed was a cool name. One of the technical draftsmen, he was on holidays up in Monaro country, and he's looking at the name that says Monaro uh, Shire Office. And he thinks to himself, Monaro, what a great name. From out of the dawn and into your life comes Holden's Monaro, Australia's first sports machine. The Monaro's design was like a snapshot of our confident culture in the late 60s. By a 327 cubic inch, 250 horsepower, four barrel carby V8 engine. It's a really interesting kind of measure of the times. And I think what was going on then is there was an image Australia had of itself. It was very male. It was very muscular. It was very outdoors, it was tough, it was working class, and it was, you know, all of that. It gave Hooning an elegant new face. But not everyone could be a Monaro man. Or from Caltex. I had to pretend that I was totally at ease with this, what was then called Ocker culture. Uh, how you go, mate? Yeah, oh, geez, that's a good one. She's got a good pair, isn't she? Oh, what a god, what a pair of knockers there. So I was there, you know, embodying this sort of kind of average Australian obsessed with, Mona with the Monaro culture, the, you know, the streets of sort of racing, hooning cars. Ford was going groovy too. They had their own pop band called The Going Thing to sell their cars. The 
band's image was sweet and wholesome, but Ford's answer to the Monaro was anything but. The GDHO was the most powerful car that had ever been made in Australia. It idled like a wild beast and didn't drive smoothly until it reached 100 miles per hour. On the side of the car was a sticker called the Super Roo. Quiet encouragement from the Ford company to put your foot down. My brother and his crew, when they got to driving age, they used to draw a line across the highway, not far from our place, and race cars from there to Swansea through the S's. And some people got it spectacularly wrong because it seemed that when it went wrong in those days, without the buffer of two lanes or uh, arm co fencing, it was fairly major road carnage and a lot of guys died. It took a while for a grim reality to dawn. Australia has one of the highest road accident rates in the world. Well, many things have been blamed, from overpowered and unsafe cars to our congested and poorly planned city roads and our laughable highways. But researchers claim that 85% of the accidents come from sheer bad driving. It would take years to force the changes to make our roads safer. But meanwhile, We'd found a place to let our suburban dream machines off the leash. It was a country road that had been turned into a lethal race circuit. A Mount Olympus for hoons. The race was called the Bathurst 500 but everyone knew it was Bathurst. I still remember the day I drove to Bathurst and came over the Blue Mountains and see the Mount Panorama sign on the hills. Hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It's just an amazing feeling. And you know that you're gonna be lining up on the starting grid. Bathurst 500 was like Red X of old. It grew out of the suburbs, and anyone could go racing in their everyday cars. Just about anybody could get a CAMS licence, stick a number on the side, pay your entry fee, and, and, and get to the motor race. Oh, the Bathurst race was a very big deal. And uh, in those days, it was more than just Holden and Ford. There were, there were Datsuns in there, there were Chargers in there. It was, it, I think it meant more to the average person. Well, it, there was a feeling there that wasn't with anything else or any other sport or any other television event. It was, it was something that said, here are cars that I see every day driving around Bathurst with number plates on them too. Get out my way! It wasn't just the boys. Christine Gibson drove a Mini. I distinctly remember enjoying the speed. Manoeuvring the car at speed was just such a thrill. Or else you get your heavy six feet of Meanwhile, leaders have reached halfway and the Falcons start to present a serious challenge to the Monaro. Fred Gibson drove for Ford in his first Bathurst. At Bathurst in a Falcon HO, if you didn't look after the, the, the brakes on that car, they're so fast, and they had drum brakes in the back in the early days, you'd have no, you could have no brakes in an hour in the race. You didn't know any different yeah. about it. That's what it was like. Yeah. You know, so all these class cars all racing together, and, the, and, and, the, and these flag marshals coming out, and the pit counter was a wooden fence with the bloke hanging over the wooden fence. I mean, that's what it was like. Fred won in 1967. The next kid behind the wheel for Ford was fresh off the boat from Canada. He looked like an angry maths teacher, but he could drive. I was new boy on the block. We just got there. There was no running as we do today, having practice all week long. So on Friday, the Ford fellow said, oh, we'll better show you the circuit. And we got up onto Skyline. No wall whatsoever. 600 foot drop. 
And I said, well, that's the last time I've ever looked left. Thomas recaptures third place from Chivers with some attacking driving. But almost immediately after going over Skyline, Robert's car spins and crashes backwards down a steep slope. He had to stay on the high side of the hill going up the hill to the mountain, and then you get, you know, to the top. The thing is with going up the top, it's blind because every next corner is blind and you come up over the crest at the top of the hill and then the car comes down and dips down and you turn left across through McPhillamy and, and then it's blind again. You've got no idea except sky, beautiful sky you're looking at and it just goes straight down. It's the most unbelievable feeling going down. You're coming down the hill, but there might be two Falcons and a Mini or whatever. The cars, as you go across the hump, would move across the road from the wind. They'd blow you across the road. And you have to, you have to see it right on the left-hand side as much, because when you go, the, so what you're doing 150 mile an hour, say, in a Falcon, like a HO, and the wind would pick you up and push you across the road. My first race was in a Morris Mini Deluxe at Bathurst in 67. Top little car. And, and they would go past in the Fords. And, and my Mini would just go that way across the road about 10 feet no, and they'd, they'd be all going past at 150 and I'd be sitting there trying to get it back on the road. The race was televised live to the nation and the car companies knew that if they won Bathurst on a Sunday, they sold more cars on a Monday. That raised the stakes. I think people could be forgiven for thinking that we were having a great time, this is our, our given profession, and gee, you guys, you know, you're really having fun out there. No, we weren't having fun. Second at Bathurst doesn't actually get too many headlines. The next generation of rev heads were watching and waiting for their turn. I reckon I was about eight. It was the first thing that I could sit and watch for eight hours without having any sense of being bored. If even then I sensed the drama, I sensed the excitement, I could sense there was something special about it. And there was that real sort of sense of, I could actually do this. This is something that is so close to what I do every day. It's amazing. Bathurst brought the rivalry of Holden and Ford to every street in the country. The fans were a new species. Bogans, rev heads, call them what you will. They were on their way to burn rubber in the street near you. Cars were racing us into a wild new era. But not everyone would make it around Forest Elbow safely. The dark side of the dream was just around the corner for Australia. The time of the car wars. Random testing was intensified. This has been a familiar sight for many motorists in Victoria. Next week, competition, rivalry, and the battle to stay alive in the series final of Wide Open Road next Sunday night. And on Wednesday, Poe's travels take us to Melbourne's back streets to share the serious culture of coffee and the food it inspires in Poe's Kitchen on the Road, Wednesday night at 8 on ABC One.